It is a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Aaron Stevens from Willamette Dental Group. And he's a 2007 grad at Temple University School of Dentistry. He works for Willamette Dental Group, a large capitation group in the Northwest as a general practitioner and a manager. He runs a clinic of six general practitioners with full-time endodontist, orthodontist, part-time periodontist, and part-time oral surgeon. He's been married 14 years and a father of two. He likes playing tennis, canyoneering in Southern Utah, and reading Dental Town. Thank you for that plug. Hey, buddy, the reason I wanted to get you on is because, you know, when I got out of school in 87, uh, my dental office just had its 29th anniversary. Um, it was mostly solo practitioners. I mean, at least 80%. And the group practices, maybe it was two people, but now of course we've seen uh, we've seen a uh, group, and so I wanted to get you on the show uh, and ask you. Um, you call yourself kind of an alternative delivery system. Uh, capitation is what you do, yeah. and that that's very very rare. I mean, I don't. What percent of the dental offices do you think are capitation practices? You know, honestly, I, I couldn't give you an answer on that. It, it can't be a very high percentage. But the, the group that I work with, I mean, I think we're probably 130, 140 docs in 60 offices, one of which I'm one. So we're in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And, you know, when I started out in this whole thing, I was gung-ho private practice. I, that's where I wanted to be. But I found I love this, and there's a lot of benefit to me. And I, honestly, I don't want to you know, tell you one's better than another. I'm glad there's variety out there. I think the consumer benefits from that, that there's alternatives and uh, I love it. I really do. I mean, the cool thing is I'm sitting there uh, yesterday. I did a root canal I was real proud of. I could, you know, turn around to my endodontist and go, ha, 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 rub his face in. It was perfect. Well, let, let's, um, why don't you explain to our viewers because uh, about, um, about 70% is U.S. dentist and 30% are in 149 other countries. Explain your alternative delivery model of capitation versus uh, fee for service or uh, PPO or indemnity insurance. Could you explain those definitions for our viewers and dental yeah, students? I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Your, ba your basic fee for service practice, I mean, it's you walk in, you have a problem with the tooth, you pay to get it fixed. That's simple. I mean, it's kind of like when I go to the grocery store. It's fee, I pay a fee for a service. Um, our system's a little bit different. Let's say, for example, if you uh, Maybe our sales team goes over to you know Gold's Gym and says, "Hey, you know Gold's Gym, we we will provide all the dental services for all of the employees that want to sign up on our plan at a very reduced rate. I mean, great benefits, all that stuff. And if all of those patients are really high needs patients, they come in to see us. And if they, you know, if they bombed out mouths, we're going to end up losing money because we have to you know provide all those services." If we, if we can help those patients get and stay healthy over time, assuming they stay with our plan, we make our money on the front end with premiums. Capitation means per head. And uh, the reason why I like it is it puts what's best for the patient, what's best for the practice, the insurance company, and the dentist all in the same line. We're all pulling the same direction. So if I can get somebody to catch a cavity early, get it fixed before it turns into a root canal, that's good for the patient. They like that. It's good for the dentist. I don't end up needing to do a root canal. It's good for the insurance. They don't have to pay for a root canal. Everybody wins. I think when you line up what's best for everybody, it works well. You know, when I first got out of school, I they started floating those capitation plans. In fact, for a while, the dentist thought this guy was falling and it was the end of the world. But I thought the the biggest problem at the time, because, you know, I like to analyze everything. I mean, I, I studied good. every business model I could. Um, but the indemnity insurance premiums for like uh say this is like 1987 was like 20 dollars yeah. a month for delta dental but if but the ones that were doing capitation they cut that in half so it was like 10 dollars. so i thought to myself okay well you're back then in the day you were saying okay well instead of me the individual shifting the risk of the patient needs to a third party indemnity insurance like delta dental and they pay fee for service a percent of my fees. Now you want to transfer the risk to me, the individual, and I got to manage that population. I thought, okay, that that does sound interesting. And if it would have been twenty dollars a month, even Stephen back in nineteen eighty seven, I did it. But then I'm looking at this contract saying, well, dude, you cut my my fee my income in half. But you, um, I I found you. You didn't find me. I found you. Um, you've done a lot of work with the Washington Dental Quality Assurance Commission. That's how I got turned on to you. Um, tell me what that's all about. 
You know, in every state, there's a regulatory board that deals with um, managing the rules for practice and also that handles discipline. And I'm as fortunate enough fortunate enough to be able to be uh, uh, serving on this commission where we're able to analyze discipline and make rules and you know really manage the practice of dentistry within this state. Um, it's, is, is that the oh, is that in Arizona the government's the Arizona State Board of Dental Examiners? Is that the Washington State Board of Dental Examiners? I mean the government, the government agency. Name. Yep. Yeah. Uh -oh. it's, it's, in Washington State, it's, it's associated with the Board of Health. They're just the the government regulatory body for okay. dentistry within the state. And I, I want to try and make a, a you know quick clarification today. As I'm here today, I'm a wet finger dentist. I'm just here representing myself. I don't represent the board. I don't represent Willamette. I'm just here on my own and happen to belong to the two and believe in both. But you did mention Gold's Gym. I think you were plugging Gold's Gym. Was that because you're lecturing you, to an old bad BMI, guy? I, <laughs> this, with this BMI, could I possibly be plugging Gold's Gym? <laughs> I thought maybe, maybe you were subconsciously mentioning Gold Gym, so you might be giving me a hint after this podcast to go lift some weights. Oh gosh, no! I'll, I'm the one that needs to do that. So, so basically, you're a volunteer. Is it a volunteer or a paid position on the, when you do that for the government? Um, as with everything, it's a gray area. Um, it is a volunteer position. You get appointed by the governor, and they do they do give you a very small amount of money. By, by small, I mean less than what we pay most of us assistants for the time that you're there. And honestly, if, you, if I average the hours you put in for the hours that uh, I get paid for, I'm probably making a good six, eight bucks an hour doing it. So what, what, you do what, it made, because, what made you want to do that? Did you just feel a sense of I want to give back or, is it, or did you see wrongs in the marketplace that you wanted to work on to correct or what, what made you want to do that? Because you're married and got two kids. Very good point. You know, to be perfectly candid, um, I think we need good rules in the state. Dentistry can go a lot of different directions. And if you don't have somebody reasonable at the helm and hopefully a good group of somebody's, it can go squampus. I want to be practicing this state for the next 20 years. I don't want stupid things going on. And uh, I, I had a couple of buddies that were also that had also done it. And they said, you know, we think you'd be good at it. And so I tried out and was accepted. One of the with Willamette, since I was doing kind of some management, uh, the management side of things, in addition to the regular dentistry, it just kind of seemed like a natural fit. I mean, I was already there helping make policy, so why not do it at a bigger level? And was it, how long you been doing it? You know, I've been I've been uh, managing with Willamette for the last, gosh, six years, and I've been working with the state for the last eighteen months. You can do f two four year terms and. Uh, Hopefully they'll let me do. Hopefully they'll let me do a second one in another three years or so. So share us some stories from the from the government side, because I, I I'm pro. You know when when I read the history of mankind, you know go back to the earliest recorded history about fifteen thousand years ago, it seems like the overruling thing is management. I mean I think government's a form of management, and what humans don't like yeah. is they don't like um they don't like anybody telling them what to do. I mean even when my kids were little, I mean they used to get mad at me when I was two years old when you told them they had to take a nap or go to bed. I mean. Humans don't like anybody telling them what to do. They don't like transparency. And I think every system is healthier if it has a lot of transparency and a lot of competition. And every time you hear a human open his mouth, the two things they hate the most is transparency, uh, which is why probably 80% of the dentists on Dental Town are anonymous uh, to the public. I know who they are, uh, or you can't get on. Um, but, and they don't like competition. So, uh, so you're kind of going against the monkey grain. <laughs> totally true. I agree with you. I think we need competition. That's why I kind of like the fact that I'm I'm associated with a different type of business model that gives consumers choice. I like that. And I really like transparency. Um, if you're going to have the public trust dentistry, there needs to be some sort of accountability because really our licenses come from the public entities. My license comes from the Department of Health, which is a government regulation, which is, gets its power from the people. So in order for that to work well, we need to have some public members, which we do. In fact, the president of the Washington Dental Quality Assurance Commission is not a dentist. That's, this is the first year that's true. And then um, there's a bunch of us dentists there that are able to analyze cases that come through. Just to kind of give you an idea of how, that's, how that works, Howard, let's say you come up to Washington and you say, you know, I've got a toothache. Uh, you come see me and you go, gosh. Uh, now, Dr. Stevens, uh, you, after 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 you, I see you, you say this guy sucks. He's terrible, and uh, you you can call up the Quality Assurance Commission or go online and fill out a complaint. 
kind of hoping you don't, but you know, just saying. And what will happen is every Friday, a group of us dentists will uh, get together and we will read through those complaints and discuss and decide what ones have merit and what ones don't and choose to investigate certain ones of those. You know, if they seem serious, um, you know, real things that we need to know more about. At that point, an investigator goes out, investigates the case, sends the case on to one of us. We analyze it and present it to a panel. And that panel will say, yeah, okay, there's something to this. We need to pursue it or there's not and we drop it. And in all honesty, if you look at how many dentists there are in the state, how many dental interactions that take place, and how many complaints there are, it's almost nothing. Um, you figure there's 6,000 dentists in the state, maybe they say 20 patients today, you know, do the, do the math on that. You're looking at, you know, let's see, 12, uh, 120,000 dental interactions in a day. And there might be, you know, maybe four complaints. That's a pretty low percentage. And of those complaints, a very low percent are you know, valid and significant. And we just go after the ones that, or we need to think, see things fixed because of that small percentage, there definitely are some problems. I would also like to, uh, after, you know, when I travel around the world, um, you know, the seven and a half billion humans kind of looks like a big, long marathon race. And 20 countries <laughs> are kind of leading the pack, whether it be Japan, Korea, you know, Germany, uh, some are at the very end of the trail, whether it be, you know, um, Congo or people, you know, tearing themselves up. But um, this whole board thing, if uh, dental students listening to this want to know, you know, they just think the board always existed since, uh, you know, the very beginning. There was a guy, did you ever read the Paul Starr uh, Pulitzer Prize running book, The Social Transformation of American Medicine, The Rise of a Sovereign Profession and the Making of a Vast Industry? I haven't read it. Sounds like I should. It's one of the few Pulitzer Prize winning books that um, I've read twice. Another one was uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Another one was uh, uh, Sapien um, uh, from the same writer of Guns, Germs, Steel. But basically, uh, 1900, um, there were no boards. There were no regulations for medical schools, dental schools. And all the doctors were riding around the countryside, and every one of their uh, medicines was basically some elixir of a uh, morphine, cocaine, <laughs> heroin, alcohol, and it would grow hair and make you skinny and kill, cure all your diseases. And it was the sure. it was the patient outrage in 1900 that was screaming to the government, you know, how can I tell if my doctor's a quack or not? And so they they passed um, some laws, and in one day they made each one of the 50 states start a state board who became the judge, jury, and the executioner. They could license a, a medical or dental school or close it down. They could license a doctor or uh, shut him down. And they weren't, um, you can't sue these boards. I mean, they're the judge, the jury, and the executioner. And the people loved it. And in like the first year they enacted it, they basically closed down 80% of all the schools and unlicensed and, and all, about 80% of the doctors that applied for licensure uh, couldn't get it because they all went to diploma mills. They all went to these programs that were a month long in somebody's barn in Olathe, Kansas. And the next thing you know, they were a doctor selling morphine. And, and as I travel around the world, uh, I don't want to mention countries because it sounds bad, but um, you know, in Brazil and in India and in Indonesia and in China, uh, they're going to have to go through the same thing. So if you're an international student, if you're an American student of history and want to know where this all came from, read The Social Transformation of American Medicine, The Rise of a Sovereign Profession, The Making of a Vast Industry by Paul Starr. And if you're in um, uh, a um, another big country where you see these dental schools, I mean, you, you go to some of these dental schools and the dental schools are anywhere from a five-year program, a four-year program, a three-year program, a two-year program, a nine-month program, and a three-month program. Now, you took math do a distribution. Do you think the three month program could be different than the five year program? Yeah, I definitely do. Debt load would be different too. <laughs> and then he wrote another book, uh, which did you read as uh, his second one? Um, it was, um, it was called the, um, um, what year did that come out? Uh, it's tough having a, uh, Paul Starr, uh, Remedy and Reaction, the Peculiar American Struggle, struggle Over Healthcare Reform. Uh, that's another uh, classic that's a, uh, I'm trying to think. Ryan, can you uh, read that and tell me when that book came out? And then uh, email a copy of that to me and Rebecca. But I'm sorry to interrupt. But uh, so, yeah, so these, what's that? 
Uh, it came out in 2013, June 4, 2013, two and a half years ago. But um, um, these dentists, uh, they hate the board. But if it wasn't for the board keeping out 80% of all the people who wish they could be making dentures and cleaning teeth and all that stuff, they sure as heck wouldn't be able to charge $1,000 for a crown. It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be chaos. It would be. In, in reality, both the public and the profession are well served by having a good common sense regulatory board that maintains um, high standards of performance and protects the public from substandard work. Now, is it perfect? No. But it really is, you know, growing up, I'm kind of a right wing guy. I, that's not a not a huge big government guy. But I have grown a brand new, huge appreciation for government on the state level. These people work effectively. They're efficient. They're passionate about what they do. And they do a damn good job. I have been nothing but impressed by the people that I've associated with on the board, both the dentists and the DOH staff. They're amazing. And they do. They really do have the best interest of the public at heart. Well, you know, uh, life's a journey. So if you're an anti-government guy, I mean, I was raised in Kansas by, um, you know, mom and dad that went to Catholic mass every single day and you're either Republican or you were not. <laughs> and then, you know, you, you were either a Kansas Catholic Republican or you were not. I mean, there was only two groups of people on the planet. But, you know, um, as I get older and go around the world, I mean, like, like take my house. You know, the, um, you know, everybody in America, you always talk about this great big economy, but half the stuff you buy doesn't even last a year. I mean, how many times does grandma on a fixed income have a plumber come out to fix her toilet and 30 days later it's broke again? Be in Germany, you'd have to be a tradesperson. You'd have to get a license. You'd have to take continue education. Everybody is a trade. And, and in Germany, the German would fix your toilet and probably last 10 years. So, and yep. then in America, if you say, well, the government should get bigger and regulate all plumbers, all people, electricians, all people doing sheetrock, you know, just make everything a trade. And instead of leaving high school and having to go to college to be, you know, a doctor, dentist, or lawyer, Germany and Japan says, well, if you don't want to be a doctor, let's put you in carpentry, electrician, or plumbing, but let's really school you and license you so that when you do go plumb a house or fix a toilet, that, that you'll know what you're doing. And so yeah. uh, I, 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 I've, I always thought that the people who are the most anti-government are just simply the people that are, don't want to be transparent, don't want any checks and balance, and just want to do whatever the hell they want. Um, auto shops, Wait. that's another one. I mean, you go ask 100 ladies in America and said, if your car was making a funny noise and you took it to an auto shop and he said you need a new engine, uh, what percent of the time would you believe him? What percent of the time would you think he was selling you a new engine? And almost every American woman will say, I would not trust him. And they would, you know, so that's a, that's a sad criteria of, a, of America. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, that, that, that's horrible if all the women um, don't trust uh, the people selling their cars, fixing their cars, auto mechanics. You know, they, they even call them, I mean, every joke is about a used car salesman. You know, Howard, I think it comes down to balance. I mean, there's total regulation, um, there's absolute anarchy, and the truth and with the balance is probably up right about in the middle, and I think that's where we're at. Um, we have a good deal of freedom. Dentists enjoy a great degree of latitude in how they practice, and there's a lot that's acceptable, um, and that's good. Uh, it gives the public variety to choose from. They, they benefit from a diverse competitive marketplace, and since that exists, um, they can get all sorts of care out there. Most of it's really pretty good. And I, I think we're in a good place with that. And, you know, the, the Quality Assurance Commission is part of, a part of that. So how do you think um, you think differently yourself and your practice when you're giving a lump sum of money, a capitation, a fee to take care of people per month and you just get the revenue? How, how do you think you manage your population of patients differently than someone on a fee for service? Okay. First off, I want to preface this that I think there are good, well-intentioned people in both camps. So I, I, in, in saying that I like one versus the other, I'm not knocking either group. I, I realize that's playing both sides of the fence here. But when I go in to see a patient, I am looking for how can I help make this guy, this person predictably healthy long-term. And that means if I need to crown a tooth, if that's what it takes for me to not have to deal with that tooth for a long time, that's what we do. It, it behooves me to find problems while they're small, fix them while they're small so they don't blow up into big things. And there's economic pressure to do that, and that's good for me, and it's good for the patient. 
nobody wants to need a root canal. So if, if I can fix a tooth conservatively or if I can help remineralize a tooth, if I can you know, practice the best evidence-based dentistry that I'm capable of, I will have a patient who has less problems and is healthier. And I would argue, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to you know, get flamed for this, I would argue that my patients get more health per dollar in this system than anything else on the planet. I That's would, a big statement, I know. I would also bet my car, and definitely Ryan's car too. No, we'll, I'll just bet Ryan's car that um, you do a hell of a lot more fillings than crowns. I bet you do a lot more MOD fillings instead of crowns. In my population, I've been treating the same group for about seven years. So I've got a pretty stable population. I've handled most of the decay at this point. So at this point, I think earlier you would have been right. Now it's probably a pretty even split. I, I do a lot of gold crowns. I do a fair number of PFMs. I do what I think is going to help the patient keep the tooth the longest. And if that if that means MOD, great. If it means crown, crown it. Um, what do you what do you think about? There seems to be a lot of controversy with silver diamine uh, floor uh, treatment. Uh, when you have pediatric kids, uh, there are some pediatric dentists who are getting amazing results by putting that silver uh, is it silver diamine on it and kill the decay. That's, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah um, that's it. Have you guys tried that? You know, we're just starting, so I'm just getting my feet into it. So I'm I'm not as conversant in that as I should be. But really, it behooves a capitation system to be on the being on the cutting edge of prevention, which means if they can find a cavity, well, or let's say find an incipient lesion before it becomes a cavity, go in there and kill it with some good SDF, um, and prevent that tooth from starting that life cycle of you know little filling, big filling, crown, root canal extraction. If you can stop it in the beginning stages, that's that's a win for the patient and a win for a capitation system. And what's on the SDF? Silver diamine fluoride? Is it diamine? Yes. I believe so. Silver diamine fluoride, yeah, that that is interesting. So, so tell us stories from your um, Washington Del Dental Quality Assurance Commission or stories right, on so your work. I, I got to be careful on casework here, but the number one question I get asked by dentists when they say, "Hey, you're on the board, what do you see?" is they ask me, "Okay, what are the common pitfalls? What do guys run into that tend to sink them?" And then they also say, "And where are all the complaints coming from?" And I think a lot of their eyes get big when they hear first where the complaints come from. In my experience, and that's not you know speaking for everybody there, of course, I see a very high percentage of complaints from former staff, current staff, obviously disgruntled, um, ex-wives. That shouldn't be a, a big surprise. Some patients, um, I see a lot of denture patients. And we also get a fair number of complaints from insurance companies. So that's where we get the bulk of our complaints. So, 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 so other people that know you intimately, like former staff, current staff, your ex-wife is telling the, they send a letter to the board that says the dentist is doing what? I mean, they, they send in um, bad x-rays. Is it personal behaviors? Is, they, is it he's drinking or, you know, what, what are, what is the gamut? <laughs> Let, let's say that, uh, let's say we've got a dentist who's drinking too much. Let's say we've got somebody with unsteady hand. Let's say we've got somebody who is cutting corners where he shouldn't be, something with infection control. Um, let's say that you wrote a prescription for your wife, you know, back when you guys were getting along and all of a sudden you're not getting along and she knows that's, against, that's not okay and she'll burn you for it. Oftentimes dentists were doing something that was, you know, they were trying to be nice, trying to do a favor for somebody. Maybe they did something off the books. Maybe they, uh, you know, treated a neighbor kid, never made a chart for them. Those are the kind of things that get you burned. What's that old saying? Um, no good deed. No good deed goes unpunished. I know yep, a dentist. Yep. I know a dentist who uh, is uh, his uh, dental assistant was complaining about the cost for birth control, so he let her order the birth control pills out of uh, the Shine catalog. And he lost uh, his uh, uh, prescribing rights or whatever for like a year, and I'm, yep. I'm just like, yeah, no good. I mean, you know, it's it's birth control. It should it should be sold at the grocery store or Seven Eleven to begin with, but that doesn't matter, does it? Not really. I actually I had an experience you know, kind of going down that road where uh, had a had a buddy of mine call me. His kid's tooth was loose. It was Friday night, and I, you know, office is all closed, and it's not you know not my office anyway. I'm I'm an employee. And uh, he says, hey, can you get it out? And I'm all, you know, you can come on over to the house. And he did. And he came out. And I taught his daughter how to take it out. So she pulled it, not me. 
because I don't want to be doing a, you know, work on somebody where there's not a, uh, where there's not a chart involved. Told her if she could get the tooth out herself, she could go jump on the bouncy house in the basement, talked her through it. But I didn't touch a tooth because I knew I'd be in violation. Well, had to be careful. Well, you know, they used to tell us back in the day, I don't know if this was uh, uh, still true, that if no dollar, um, if no money um, passes hands, that all the rules don't kick in. I mean, uh, that's not true at all. No, 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 no. You know, you're held to the same standard whether you charge them a dollar or nothing. In fact, I've seen a fair number of cases where we have complaints from the person who the dentist was working for for free, like where a dentist will go volunteer and then the person complains against them, makes a board case out of it. I've seen many of those. Oh, my God. And, and I, I know that's sad, and that's one of the reasons why I generally don't get involved in free dentistry. I'll go, I'll go do something else with somebody. I'll mow their lawn. I'll help them out. But I... When it comes to dentistry, I tend to keep the charity side of it out because I've just seen, you know, like you said, no good deed going unpunished. Um, That's not what, wonderful. What is the um, what is the state of uh, substance abuse there? I mean, you, I can't go a month where a spouse, an assistant, a sister, a brother, someone of a dentist is is really, you know, is really concerned about someone. Some fear that if they go there, they're going to lose their license, go to jail, whatever. Other states um, treat it more as a disease where they. They come in and say, okay, this is a disease. You need to go to treatment. Does Washington see it more as uh, punish you for doing uh, an immoral bad decision by drinking or eating Vicodin or uh, what have you, and uh, or is it more as a disease? You know, they've got a good balance. They know that they – this has actually been a real hot topic lately, especially since, you know, that uh, – I think we had the – there was a article in the New York Times talking about um, prescription opioid abuse, and you know some states have asked. In fact, a couple of states' dental boards have asked dentists not to use narcotics as their first line of defense when treating pain. You've probably already probably already know that. Washington's view is really cool. They say, "Hey, we need to protect the public. That's that's our primary function." So we can't let somebody run around on drugs doing that stuff. So they have a, a system set up where they're able to, um, they have a physician monitoring service where if they find a practitioner who is starting to abuse drugs, and either this can be self-reported or this can be you know something that comes out of a case, they put them in a treatment program where they have to be monitored fairly constantly, have to go to meetings, and they try and treat it like the disease that it is because they know if they treat it like, you know, you're bad, you're bad, there's going to be a lot of under-reporting of it where people can't get the treatment that they should. So to get the balance of protecting the public, and if that person starts going down a bad road in that program where they're not in compliance, really slipping up a lot, and, and they're, it's affecting patient care, then it's reported to the board, and the board can, you know, step in and stop them. So they treat it like a disease, but there's, uh, there's mercy on both sides. They're really trying to protect the public the best way they can. It's, it's a good setup. In any data I've seen is that dentists have the same divorce rate and substance abuse rate as the general public. Uh, the divorce, the substance abuse rate, uh, just a slightly under 14%. And the divorce rate, it's like a half of a percent more than the general public at, uh, at five years and 10 years. So they're probably, uh, whereas anesthesiologists have like twice the national rate. Um, that makes so, sense. Um, I want another can of worms. Um, did your state legalize marijuana, right? For just. It did. Yeah. For, for yeah I'm not I, really excited about that. I know that um, I have talked to. <laughs> no names mentioned. I have talked to a few deans where no one knows what to do because yeah. uh, there's obviously faculty getting high some are getting high and do a say to the students yeah when they woke up wake up they smoke a bowl and uh and on lunch break they'll smoke um up and but anyway they're like okay this is legal in colorado this is legal in well it's partially legal um in many states because you, know, you can go to a doctor like in arizona you can go to a doctor and, and get it for medical yep. marijuana because i have chronic pain or uh, you know, I could probably get it for being obese and hair loss. I think it treats both of those at the same time. But what what do you? But what do you? Um, what is Washington's view of a dentist who legally buys marijuana and um, is practicing while high? You know, I can't speak for the state on this. I can just speak for myself that impaired is impaired. Whether you drink a bottle of Nyquil, whether you drank a fifth of gin, or whether you smoked a bowl, impaired is impaired. 
Now, there's federal law that you know that is contrary to state as far as you know marijuana, and you know employment law also gets really interesting with it. But from my perspective, if there's anything that's impairing that dentist, whether it's Vicodin that he got legally for you know a bad knee or something like that, he can't be practicing. He has to stop until he is not impaired. Interesting. I wonder if Google uh, Google's driverless cars will be a game changer where you can um, go to a bar on a Friday night, watch a game, and then get in your back seat and have your car drive you automatically home so you don't get a DUI. Well, I bet that's I around the corner. That. Huh. I wonder if it'll keep the road safer because the guy isn't driving. Yeah. It'd be, be interesting. Um, so um, – what advice, uh, you know, podcasters are, um, they're pretty much under 30. And this show cool. has gone uh, viral. It's gone huge. Um, and about 20% of who you're talking to are dental students. And the other 80% are probably under 30. Um, I got one email today by someone who said, hey, I'm actually 57 years old. Listen to your show. But what advice, <laughs> what advice would you give the, the, the kids? They they're, they're um, they just come out of school. They're just graduating. They they, they fear the board. I mean, their worst nightmare is that they got a letter from the board. What, what, yep. would, what advice would you give them? First off, realize that there is a state dental act. There is a state dental act. You probably ought to be familiar with the rules because each state is a little bit different. Oregon, Washington, and Idaho are all have slightly different laws. You probably ought to know them. Read it. Um, if you want to get involved with the board, it's a good idea. Second, Find a mentor. I mean, whether you're in large group practice um, or your solo practice, find somebody around who's worth your respect and really try and learn from them. As we all know, when we finish up with dental school, we are minimally competent. We can do the procedure, but handling the aftercare, handling the problems that inevitably do show up is takes a lifetime of learning. You need somebody around you to help mentor you through that. And those are probably going to be my number two things. Number two things, learn the laws, find a mentor who you trust, and then find another. And last, third, get on Dental Town. Get on there and read and read and read. You can learn a ton in your off hours. If you're just starting to practice, you're going to have some time to pick your nose, get that phone out, and just start reading Dental Town. I mean, you've got it right there. So you, you uh, are you more on the app than the, uh, than the, uh, than the PC? Um, this is the first time I've used this PC in months, and I, my phone is on me twenty four seven. Yeah. Hey, um, it's probably fun. Does the um do you, do you work with? Uh, you, you said you got some complaints from dental insurance companies. What what why is it that how often and what is dental insurance is uh, contacting the board for? Every once in a while, if somebody gets sued and it's of a uh, sufficient dollar value, they'll refer it over to the local state board, and the board will choose to investigate or not. A lot of them, at least in Washington, we have a threshold where we, we look at the type of complaint it is, and there are certainly some that we'd investigate no matter what. But uh, you know, we look at the, the dollar value, and if it's high enough, we go, you know, we probably ought to look into that. I want to I want to um, I want to talk about a, a, the the darkest area of dentistry. Um, the um... <laughs> oh. Well, you know, it just, um, you know, when somebody dies, you know, I mean, how, it, it, to me, the people that I've known or have met were, uh, um, well, first of all, it seems like when somebody dies in a dental office, which would be the worst case scenario, not losing a molar, I mean, uh, when somebody dies, um, it always has an IV in their arm. It's always about sedation. They, it's always sedation. I have, I have never done, I mean, I, I played with it. I had an anesthesiologist coming in and back in the day and then my anesthesiologist quit because he was having nightmares and he had a couple yep. of you know he he was from oregon and after dental school he did a two-year residency and was a board certified anesthesiologist at every hospital in town and he he was having nightmares he said you know what i just can't do it and i had an oral surgeon friend of mine that said you know what the only nightmares i have or with orthognathic surgery, and it's only, it's not even 1% of my practice. And he said, the minute I woke up one morning, I said, you just had a nightmare again about a Lafort fracture or orthognathic. He goes, I'm done. And 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 he said he, he dropped 1% of his revenue and 99% of his, his nightmares. Um, but, um, you know, you just had that case in Hawaii, and now they're they're uh, filing you know homicide charges against her. And, and um, you know, so so what are, you, what are your thoughts about sedation, IV sedation, conscious sedation. 
Um, cause a lot of kids There's are thinking, a lot of kids are thinking, well, maybe I could really build my practice. If I advertise that, you know, I'll knock you out, I'll put you to sleep. It'll, you know, wake up and you'll have movie star teeth, but that's, that's a large undertaking, isn't it? It very much is. In the state of Washington, they have levels of sedation, meaning there's minimal, there's moderate, and there's general. And for the last two, you have to have a special permit to be able to do it. And really, when you think about it, I would minimal, talk to these moderate, young, and what? And general. Minimal, moderate. It should have been maximum. It should have been minimal, moderate, maximum. Why did you have? Okay, so minimal, moderate, and general. And can you explain the difference between minimal and moderate? Yeah, um, it really depends on how responsive the patient is. The threshold to be minimally sedated means that patients need to be able to respond readily to verbal commands. It's not a labored thing and they don't have a hard time going, what? If, once you start getting into where they have a hard time responding to verbal commands, that's where you get into moderate. And so it's not dependent on what you gave them to get them there, it's what level of sedation they hit. Now realize that's not a perfect setup because you give somebody you know, one pill and they get deeper than they're supposed to be, or you give somebody five and they don't get anywhere. But um, we, we leave that up to the dentist to determine how far they're going to go under to make sure that they're not going further than they should. And it really, it comes down to risk. Just like every time you stick a needle in the body, it's possible that that nerve doesn't wake up. Every time you put somebody to sleep, the deeper they go, the higher the risk that you're going to have a problem. And so in dentistry, you want to be as risk averse as you can. You, you don't want to do things that are likely to have problems. I figure that's part of my job as a dentist, to know where Murphy's sitting and be intelligent enough to navigate my way around him. So and that where, means I where, stay up sedation. Where would nitrous oxide be in your opinion, minimal or moderate? Minimal. Minimal. So nitrous would pretty much just be minimal. And would moderate be more a prescription pill like a, a benzodiazepine or a, you know, a Valium or a Xanax or something? It can be. It depends on what gets the person that far. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I realize it's very individualistic. It's not a perfect law, and really, none of our laws are, but we do our best to, you know, taper it to what we think the situation ought to be. Again, what I do is there's, uh, you know, there's a couple of people in town that, uh, that, that want this and advertise with it, and they've done it a long time. Maureen Toe is one in uh, Phoenix where, you know, she has mailed every dental office uh, a brochure once a year for the 30 years I've been here saying if someone wants you know, to be knocked out, you know, send them my way. And so I'll, I'll just give them her card. It's like, I, I just don't want to deal with that. It's just not enough money. And I've also heard that you think that you went to a weekend course and you think you know what you're talking about, but when everything goes south and you go sit on a trial and some board certified anesthesiologist who's worked in an emergency room for 20 years starts asking you questions that you're going to look rapidly stupid, rapidly fast. I completely agree. That's why I think most guys unless they spend a lot of time in training and it shouldn't be in it. That's just personal view. No, it's not. A per There's 1 million attorneys out there and every dentist I know that lost a patient, they left, they left the profession. I mean, I mean, I mean, imagine you join the boy scouts. and The first thing you do is actually kill another boy scout. I mean, you really wouldn't want to go to boy scout lessons every, you know, I mean, um, everybody I know suffered amazing uh, depression, amazing, I mean, it was, it was just a game changer. And about the only way they could do to cope with the pain is uh, leave the profession and leave the city and just, just leave. That's part of why I like the practice system that I'm in, that there's not a lot of pressure to do that kind of stuff. I'm not, our economics aren't pushing us to take on more and more complicated cases. We want to stay in simple and predictable stuff. That's why I love what we do. In fact, one of the cool things with how we do that is we're able to analyze the data. Um, given that we're as big a practice as we are, we can take all of this information from our EHR and study it and see where our problems are so we know how to avoid them. That's a wonderful opportunity. In fact, we've got a grant for, uh, from the NIH and we're working with Harvard to be able to study outcomes on how we're treating patients since we've got a big enough patient population to do it. Um, I want you to talk another thing. Um, tell me if you agree with this or not. Um, it just seems like one of, the, one of the reasons I started Dental Town was when I saw the internet came out, I thought, okay, now no dentist has to practice solo again. And I right. saw it as a way that everybody could talk together. But outside of that, I always believed and noticed and saw that dentists who worked alone all by themselves seemed to be less happy and less having fun than people in group. I mean, 
I hired my first associate straight out of school, and I was so dumb, I didn't, I wasn't smart enough to say, hey, maybe I should get someone with 30, 40 years experience since I have none. <laughs> so what did I do? I got someone my, my exact age, Bob Savage, uh, from Creighton, the same undergrad school I went to, because I just thought it'd be so fun to work with him. You know what I mean? I just thought it'd be fun having a buddy, someone that you could just talk about stuff. Do you think dentists in group practice just have more fun than dentists in solo? I absolutely believe that they do. Um, I look at from when I started, I started and I had a, I had a mentor. I had somebody who'd been doing it 10 years. I had somebody who started the same week I did. We had a great time. And now in my office, I've got multiple dentists that have been doing this much longer than I have that I can pull their experience. I've got brand new guys. This is a hard profession and you really do need people around you to bounce ideas off of. As I'm walking down the hall, I you know, just stop it at all. Hey, what do you think of the x-rays? You see a parl there? You, I mean, does this look plain, see any cavities? I think we need that. And I think the profession and the public are better served by dentists that have the opportunity to interact. Better uh, for our mental health, too. We were talking earlier that, you know, the the, the general sapien animal does not like uh, anyone telling them, him or her what to do. They don't like anybody yeah. knowing what they're doing. They like to be alone. Another thing they hate is when someone mentions evidence-based dentistry because they uh, <laughs> and they they don't like it and and I believe that that, that the the I, I don't know what to think anymore. Like for instance, you can't you meet one of the most highly intelligent dentists on earth and you show them the research where silver fillings are lasting. You know, amalgams like last like thirty-eight years and composites right. last six. And a hundred percent of all the dentists will say. Yeah, well, that's because, you know, they studied some idiot that put them in wrong. And, you know, I, I use a rubber dam and I, I do it right. Mine lasts for 472 years and, and the, my, and amalgams fracture teeth and break teeth. And I'm like, dude, if I walk up to the homeless guy sleeping behind the dumpster at the Kentucky Fried Chicken and I hold him a metal spoon out of my kitchen and a plastic spoon from KFC and say, hey, dude, which one lasts longer? A drunk knows it's the metal one. So so how does evidence-based dentistry even work in a profession that doesn't believe in gravity or evidence? As I'll also point out, you re well remember when Reader's Digest back in the day took a set of yep. study models and x-rays, went to 50 different dentists, and how many treatment plans did he get? A ton. He I mean, they were all different. He got 50. And you, know, and, and, you know, and you know what the unreported story is of that? He stole that idea from the government. I believe it was the NIH. They went to a hundred dentists and only two of the treatment plans were the same. And that was the two dentists who said you didn't need anything. So the 98 that said you needed something, not two treatment plans were the same. Tell me how this could be an evidence-based profession when you couldn't get two dentists to agree that today is Monday. Okay, so we need to. I need to go down both of those roads. First off, I believe they're rabbit holes. Did you want to take the red, <laughs> the red pill or the the blue pill? All right. So let's say in a very large group practice, you have the ability to analyze the data and say, okay, this is what we believe as a group. The evidence suggests, and yeah, that's a messy process. But then you can implement it and expect dentists to follow it and pay them for following it. Our compensation is built on. Are you following what evidence-based dentistry says to do? And if you're not, you're not going to be with us all that long. And the cool thing is we were able to, we use diagnostic coding with our EHR so that when there is a problem, there is a certain set of, you know, when there's a diagnosis, there are a certain limited number of things you can do about that diagnosis that makes sense. You are able to have the computer help support the dentist in following evidence-based dentistry and shrink the shotgun pattern of those treatment plans from this to this. And that's, that's how our system works. And I love it. And it pays dentists to do it and do it well. Can you it's, give more examples of like, like particular cases or examples of that? Of absolutely. Um, let's say, for example, in my practice, um, there's an MOD on – tooth number 13 being done by a certain dentist, and we see that the fracture rate is really, really high. We're able to go in and say, you know what, okay, this isn't working for you, and I can retrain him into doing it, re retrain him into doing it better. We have, uh, we look at what the science says to do as the best type of sealant out there. We do that type, and then we're able to do a retrospective study looking back going, 
okay, what percentage of the time did that work? When did it not work? And we can learn from it. So we don't you know, do studies on patients, of course, but we're willing to look back at the data and find out, was this effective? It's wonderful. Do you guys play some algum? Oh, heck yes. Think of how many so teeth you would not be able to... <laughs> No, I'm a realist. I know that <laughs> the mouth is a wet place and you need something that can handle moisture. And that means amalgam or glass ionomer. I use composite when I need to for the aesthetics, but I don't put it in back molars unless I absolutely have to, and I generally don't have to. How long do you think? Uh, okay, so, you know, we're dentists. So <clears throat> the six-year molar is a tooth most likely to have a filling, an MOD, a crown, a yep. root canal, extracted, replaced an implant. And the 12-year molar behind it has usually got twice the luck because as a father that raised two kids, how old are your kids? Mine are seven and eight, and I know that they brush like seven and eight-year-olds. That's why I brush after they do. So, so um, what? how long do you think an, an, an amalgam would last on a six-year molar versus a composite? Well, as you and I both know, it entirely depends on how much decay there was and how big that composite is, the ratio of tooth to filling. If I, I have in my teeth conservative alloys that were placed in 19, back when Reagan was president, they will be there when I'm 90. You and I both know amalgam lasts longer than anything else out there. Why? And, and then and then I'll go to a dentist and I'll say, okay, what is your uh, what is your biggest problem? They always say managing staff. And then I'll say, okay, after staff, what's your biggest problem? They say overhead. And I say, okay, well, um, do you, are you fee for service? They go, well, you know, we signed up for 8 to 12 PPO plans, and these PPO plans have knocked our fees down about 40%. I said, okay, so you're on PPOs, and your fees are 40% lower than they were, you know, 30 years ago, and your overhead's high, so a barrel of Clearfill SE bonding agent is a million two hundred thousand dollars and here's this little amalgam carpule. It's a couple bucks. And we're looking at a 14-year-old <clears throat> boy with a burger hanging out of his nose. He's got his hair matted up. He's worn the same damn Seahawks NFL jersey for four days in a row. <laughs> um, he doesn't like soap, uh, shampoo, or to brush his teeth. Why don't we put it in amalgam? And the dentist will tell me nine times out of ten, I'm not doing that. I don't, I don't even have amalgam in my office. I'm I'm metal free. And I'm like, do you drive metal free cars? Do you fly in metal free airplanes? Do you see mechanical engineers saying we need to start making all these uh, engines out of plastic? I mean, what? How? Do, I mean, do you do you see this, or am I meeting different? Oh, dentists? No, I, I absolutely do. I see dentists that are driven to do that. Honestly. A lot of it is their perception of what the public expects. That said, when I sit down with a patient and say, you know what, I can put something that's plastic or I can put something in that is much more likely to last, they usually pick the one that's going to last. And in a capitation system, I want that and so does the patient. Now, I, I would hope that dentists aren't picking the composite because they know, hey, in five years I'm going to be replacing it or I'll, I'll be moving towards a root canal or a crown a little bit sooner. I don't think we're that diabolical. But in all reality, is that the truth of it? You will be. You're going to have more work to do down the road the more composites you've placed. Huh, yeah, every time a composite company comes out and they always talk about uh, the megapascals, the bonding strength, and the wear rate and all that stuff, I say, look, dude, um, you always talk about wear rates. I, I've never met a dentist that said the problem with my composites, they all wear down. You always talk about megapascals, the bonding, and I've never met a dentist that said, well, my problem with all my fillings fall off. I said the problem with composites is six and a half years later, the patient – who needed the cavity in the first place, who did not change his behavior, still drinks Mountain Dew, doesn't brush, doesn't floss. There's oatmeal mush recurrent decay around this plastic. Why can't you put something in that composite that's antibacterial? I mean, you know. Try that's why That's why God invented glass ionomer. So, so talk about glass ionomer because it's rare in this country. And that's another thing. I love traveling around the world like Glass ionomer is huge in Australia and New Zealand, and it's minuscule in America. Why is that? Are you were you born in Australia? Was your uh, neighbor a kangaroo when you were born? Are you a marsupial? I was, but I work in a system where I am paid if the patient has the filling last, if they stay if they stay healthy, and we all know that you don't get a lot of recurrent decay around a glass ionomer. So I use glass ionomer on my high carriage patients all the time. It works really, really, really well. It releases fluoride back into the tooth. And I don't have to worry about things debonding like I do with composite. I just don't have to be uh, – the mouth is a wet place. Now, is this on on children or adults or who is who is this on? 
you know what? I'll, I'll do it with kids. I'll do it on kids with the class two. Um, I'll do it on some patients with the class two. If they're hell bent on having white, sometimes I can fill my box with a glass ionomer, put a little bit of composite over the top of it if I need to. Or um, there's a certain type of Fuji that was just cleared by the FDA to be able to have uh, um, to be used for class two as a permanent restoration. I think it's Fuji Equia or Fuji Nine, one of the two. I'd have to look it up. You know, and another thing that's sad is the uh, the thing that a lot of dentists want to talk about is um, about four and a half percent of Americans will end up going to a nursing home in their lifetime. About one out of twenty, and it's never yeah. a guy because guys, you know, we die about five years earlier than uh, uh, our wives, and uh, we'll just drop dead in the kitchen as we're trying to open up the refrigerator to grab a big hunk of cheese. And uh, that's true. But these these women just live forever, and one in twenty. Americans end up in a nursing home, and the nursing home data is showing that when you enter a nursing home, you're going to get one root surface decay cavity every month. So after you've been in there one year, you have 12, and then they'll yep. bring this lady grandma to the dental office, and he'll put in inert plastic composite resins on a, on a lady with Alzheimer's, and you're like, and it shows that if you uh, do that with inert plastic composite, it's not even going to last half a year. And if you did those yep. fillings with the amalgam or glass onomer, it lasts two years. And the dentist says, well, I don't, I don't believe in amalgam, and I'm not Australian or Japanese, so I don't use glass onomer. And then you talk about evidence-based dentistry. There's kind of a long way to go in this profession. I totally agree, which is why I like the business model. If you have the economics pushing longevity, then you'll get people believing. And when economics push the other direction, you're going to lose. And I'll tell you another thing <clears throat> that I'll never forget is, um, you know, Phoenix has a lot of senior citizens because a lot of people retire here for the weather and in the winter. Sure. Um, but I'm telling you something about those gold, like like some of those 80, 90-year-old women come in and they have a gold foil and you can see around the margin. You can see gaps. I mean, it's not a tight fit, but for some reason, the bugs don't grow there. And they also notice that with the, uh, the cap tech research that, that high noble surface energy gold that, I mean, microbiologists are saying, yeah, we notice bugs don't go around a high, and it makes sense. I mean, so say you move into an apartment, it's high static energy. And every time you touch someone, you get shocked versus, uh, amalgam where there's, uh, five metals in there, half mercury, half silver, zinc, copper, and tin. We use tin and stannous fluoride. There's all these tin ions flying out. There's all the, we use silver. We talked about silver diamine fluoride, and it's got silver in it. It just seems like a hostile environment for uh, streptococcus mutans to grow. And then it finds uh, this um, nice little inert plastic composite, and it says, you know what? I think I'll just live here. We should do a Goldilocks storybook about little Goldilocks finding the bed that was made out of glass onomer, the one that was made out of high energy gold foil, and then the one that was just right made out of inert plastic composite. That's awesome. That'd be just perfect. I like that story. You know, I, I, you're preaching the choir here, Howard. We need evidence-based dentistry to become a standard of care. That's important. If we, if we can require dentists to follow what the science says as we do in medicine and hold them to it, I think we have progress and we'd have a healthier patient population I think we'd do better. I, uh, another, um, another, you know, whenever you talk about socialized medicine in the United States, I mean, people literally think you are a communist and they're ready to, you know, beat you to death <laughs> with their flagpole. But I always think of my, when I have my doctor hat on, I think it's pretty bizarre that, uh, grandma passes out at the grocery store, the ambulance picks her up and they go in there and, and if they have a driver's license, they just say, okay, this is grandma Sue. And they're not connected on a database. They don't know what she's on. They're not connected to Walgreens, see all the medical records. And I look at dentistry and I always think that, you know, it's such a fragmented market of, um, you know, there's 150 different computer practice management information systems. But if all those computers were on the same and all those were in one database, I mean, and then a new product came out. Within a year, you could start saying, oh, my God, so there's 211,000 dentists, 20,000 start using this product, and at one year, 20% are failing. And then you could go back, and you could say, look at these other products, how well they're working. And I just saw, I, I'm still just love the last JOE, Journal of Endodontic article, it's just music, where they actually went to insurance data. And they looked at the insurance data, and they just want to know one question. If an endodontist, which you have working for you, or a general yep. dentist... Your opening joke was the the root canal. So you're looking at gen at endodontists. 
who are more likely to use a microscope and loops and do everything right versus a general dentist who usually doesn't have a microscope or didn't have the extra right. training. And they said, okay, on a first molar, um, what's better? And what was amazing is the endodontist um, at five years, uh, 19 out of 20 were still working. Uh, 95% were still in and working, whereas the general dentist um, was uh, 90%. So doing everything right like an endodontist only had a one out of 20 higher success rate. No, I think it was at, at 10 years um, than the general dentist who uh, wasn't an endodontist. But that's the type of data that could change the whole future. Because if I was going to have a bypass, I'd go all the way from uh, Phoenix to Seattle, where you are. You're in Seattle, right? Or uh, I'm out in the Tri City, pretty close. Yeah, I mean, and it, it would take a lot for an Arizona Cardinals fan to go to Seahawks territory, but I would do it anyway if I thought my cardiovascular surgeon had a 95% chance of fixing my heart, whereas my homie back home in Phoenix only had a 90%. I, I would travel a thousand miles for an extra 5%. Howard, I would too, and you're preaching to the choir on this one because. You know, having those databases talk, that's important. Medicine already does it. In dentistry, we need to do it. And that's why part of why I am where I am is I love that my the company I work for, that's how it works. We're able to study all of this. And my EHR does talk to the pharmacy. I know what they're on, um, not just what they tell me they're on. You need, I think group practice in, on a big scale could be really good for dentistry. It isn't for everybody. I don't want to kill private practice, but I like where this has gone for me. I'm happier. I spend more time at home with my kids. Heck, I'm home with them today. It's perfect. I love it. I want to, um, you promised me an hour and I'm down to, uh, I only got you for four more minutes. There's two other hot buttons I want to talk on. Um, yeah. it seems like the two big boogeyman's in dentistry is the OSHA monster and the HIPAA monster. Is that a real yeah. fair? Is that a real problem? Are these real issues? How often do you hear of a dentist run in with OSHA or HIPAA and that being a problem? Honestly, not that often. Um, there's certainly important laws. The concepts are out there that you know dentists need to respect uh, health, health information, just like it's handled in medicine. That said, it's not one of our main hot topics right this second. I don't see people get in a lot of trouble with it. Once in a while, we'll have a complaint, but most of our complaints are based on other things, not on OSHA. And of the and last question, and I'll let you go back to those. You got two daughters. A son and a daughter. Oh, a son and a Good daughter. Kids. And uh, um, last question is, of the nine specialties, um, which one do you think goes to the board the most? I mean, we have endodontist, periodontist, pediatric dentistry, oral surgeon. Who, which one of those people are getting in trouble the most? Which is the most controversial? Which is the ones that you're uh, looking at your uh, Washington Dental Quality Assurance Commissioner and having to uh, make rules for? I, I would say there's two answers to that. One, because general dentists are, there's so many more of them. General dentists are the, you know, the, the group that are certainly in front of us the most. But if you broke it down by percentage, I don't see a lot of endo. I don't see a lot of perio. I think you have to follow the money and look at the big implant cases. Whoever's placing the really big implant cases where there's a lot of dollars involved, if, if they're especially, I tend to see a few more of those. Now, it could be that that's just the ones I've seen, but... Where there's more money, there's more complaints. That makes total sense. One last, one last, one last question. I've, I've only asked you three one last questions so far. Um, one Abby. more controversy is um, I hear people that is always saying this uh, uh, when you're out together saying, okay, what the hell is the standard of care? Um, why, if the endodontist gets $1,000 for a molar root canal and I signed up on a PPO and I get 600 how could the board grade my root canal at 600 to a thousand dollar endo because if we go to cars gm has uh, a cadillac a buick an olds a pontiac a chevy so i get paid for a chevy i make aaron stevens a chevy and then he goes to the board and sues me because it's not a, a cadillac and i'm like dude you're having an endodontist you got paid a thousand dollars grade my molar root canal and i got 600 which is why i can't afford a scope which is why I couldn't afford all these toys that the endodontist has. What, how do you answer that? Because they, 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 they say that out in the field. Dentists do believe yeah. that and ask that. I, I think you're absolutely right that it, it isn't fair that you get paid less than an endodontist does. 
in all honesty, um, if you're held to the same standard of care, I think your reimbursement rate should be the same. I'm, I'm sure my endodontist is probably going to strangle me with a, to hear me say it, but you, you absolutely are held to the same standard of care. I don't see any reason why your reimbursement should be any different. But from our perspective, at least my perspective board-wise, the money is irrelevant. The standard of care is a standard of care. A good root canal is a good root canal. I don't care how much you got paid. That's not really my business. That's really a question for insurance companies. And that is the bottom line. Those, uh, if you're going to do root canals, you're going to be graded by the endodontist. If you're going to, you know, if you're going to treat children, you're going to be graded by pediatric dentist. And if you're going to run an IV, yep. you're going to be you're going to be graded by anesthesiologist, uh, who uh, you know, or at a whole nother level. So uh, it's a competitive world out there. So so last, last so final statement. We're in overtime. Final statement. What is standard of care? And then I swear to God, I'll let you go. Standard of care is what a reasonable and prudent dentist would have done. Nice and succinct. Okay, yep. and last, Ryan, what, what what should we call this podcast? What's the most succinct thing we should call this podcast? So when they're looking at it, they know what it was about. Um, Chip I would probably go with uh, capitation. I'm bored of capitation and misspell bored. Oh, you got it? <laughs> okay, board of capitation. Spell it B O A R D, board of capitation. Sure, yeah. That'll work. Is that what you meant? That, that's what I meant, but you probably could think of a better, if I no, think of something better, awesome. I'll send it Hey, Aaron, I called you. You didn't call me. Thank you so much for taking an hour away from your family and spending it today with me and my homies. I really appreciate it. Howard, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I really have enjoyed it, and I'd, I'd have, I'm happy to talk to you anytime. Okay, buddy, and uh, I want you to now go say a prayer that the Seahawks never win another game again. <laughs> I'm a Broncos fan, man. Oh, man, that must have been tough to on the same night that you won the Super Bowl to have Peyton Manning retire. I mean, that's got to be a wild evening, huh? It was rough. You it only, was rough. You only got to celebrate for one hour. <laughs> <laughs> All right, have a Fair good enough. day.